Hello and welcome to the Center for Maritime Medicine session on heat emergencies. By the end of this session, you'll be able to identify at least three risk factors for heat illness, list four techniques to decrease the risk of heat illness, identify the cause and treatment of heat cramps, differentiate between heat exhaustion and heat stroke, and treat a patient with heat stroke. So why do people get hot? Why is it that their body's normal regulatory functions don't work? Well, part of it can be being put into a hot environment without acclimatizing, without getting used to it, and so your body just doesn't have its mechanisms ready to go. High humidity, because we get rid of most of our excess heat by sweating, and that's evaporation of water off our skin. If it's too humid, we can't evaporate that sweat. High heat, obviously, the hotter it is, the more heat input there is. And a high workload. In a high workload, we're generating a lot of excess heat with our metabolic activity. Inappropriate dress for the environment. You need to wear clothes that are loose-fitting, that are lightweight, that breathe, and that allow excess heat and moisture to leave. And if you're wearing something that's not those things, you can end up overheating. Chronic illnesses, and particularly chronic medications, affect our body's ability to respond to heat stress so our body can't do the things it would normally do and particularly a lot of blood pressure medications diabetes also puts you at risk for heat illness dehydration because your body doesn't have the fluids necessary to cool itself down lack of sleep certainly contributes not eating well your body needs to have metabolic fuels to be able to cool itself Infections, so you're already at risk for fever, and now you're at risk for heat illness as well. Alcohol, older age, being sunburned, as this affects your body's ability to dilate and get rid of uh, this in the skin and get rid of excess heat. Decreased wind speed, the lower the wind speed, the slower the evaporation rate of sweat. So in a high wind, we evaporate sweat quickly and cool down quickly. And illicit drug use, especially stimulants, cocaine, methamphetamine, bath salts, and others, which increase your metabolic rate, increase your heat production. So how do we keep cool? Well, identify people at risk for heat illness, either people who have just joined the ship, who aren't acclimatized to the hot environment, people who are working in high heat environments, people who are going to be doing high physical labor jobs so that they're producing a lot of excess heat, Make sure that teams monitor each other's hydration status so everybody's making sure that everyone else is drinking and that fluids are freely available so everyone can be taking in fluid. Limit work. Either set up work cycles that give people appropriate breaks or limit work uh, in the hottest parts of the day. And make sure that all crew members are aware of their risk for heat illness, signs and symptoms of heat illness so that they can detect these problems early. So one of the big things that happens is dehydration. And this happens to almost everybody in a hot environment. So you've got inadequate fluid consumption for your losses. And you lose fluid through sweat. You lose it through urination and also to a certain degree through your bowel movements. And then you have insensible losses, your respiratory losses. When you're breathing, you're humidifying the air. So you're losing quite a bit of fluid that way. Normally, we consume two to three liters of water, free water, a day. And in increased temperature, increased workload, we really need to kick that up quite a bit. Now, interestingly enough, thirst is not a good indicator of whether or not you're dehydrated. By the time you're thirsty, you're way behind on your hydration. You're probably a liter, maybe two liters behind. And people will only voluntary, voluntarily replace about two-thirds of their needed volume. So... If you're in a hot environment, you're working with people in a hot environment, you're at risk for dehydration, you need to be pushing fluids even beyond what people feel like they need. Because if they wait until they feel thirsty, they're already dehydrated. And so here's the big problem. During heavy work in a hot environment, you really can't take in enough fluids to compensate. You will sweat too much. And as long as you're working, you're not going to be drinking enough fluid. You can't do both. So you have two options. One is allow people to work till they just about reach their limit and then rest. And if they rest, they need to rest to full recovery. They need to be back to their baseline. 
or take frequent breaks to give people the time to replace fluids. And what do you drink? Water. Water is what you need. Very high activity or in unfit individuals, you could consider a low sugar sports drink, something like G2 or some other similar ones. But the fact is, is the average American diet contains more than enough of the salts that are lost in sweat. So if you eat three regular meals a day, you're not eating a salt substitute or a low sodium diet, and you drink water, you will not have a problem with your salt balance uh, and your water balance. Your kidneys will take care of it. So you really don't need to drink all those electrolyte drinks unless, again, it's a very high activity, high sweat, high heat environment, so you're losing a lot of salts at a time, or you're very unfit, which kind of puts you at risk for those things. Symptoms of dehydration include dizziness and lightheadedness. Your vision may get blurry. You may get nauseated or have some abdominal pain, which is really ironic because you develop the nausea, and then you don't want to drink any more fluids, and that makes your dehydration worse. It's one of the poor design systems in the human body. You feel fatigued. You can get headache. You, you'll begin to feel thirsty eventually, and you'll get the umbles. You'll stumble. You'll mumble. You'll fumble, and you'll tumble. So you lose fine and then gross motor coordination. Signs include orthostatic vital sign changes, the most important of which is that if you go from sitting to standing, you pass out or feel like you're going to pass out. But if your heart rate jumps quite a bit or your blood pressure drops quite a bit, that's also concerning. Dry mucous membranes, so looking in the mouth, it's not wet and glistening, it's dry and shriveled looking. Skin tenting, you pull on the skin and it stays pulled up. Sunken or glassy eyes and a decreased urine output. And there are militaries around the world that use a pee-on-demand system. That is, every hour you have to stop and be able to pee 500 mLs of urine or thereabouts. And if you can't, you have to stop and drink at least one and preferably two liters of fluid. So on-demand peeing. How do you treat this? Fluids. Your body absorbs fluids best if you take them orally. So give the people oral fluids if they can. Push the oral fluids, more oral fluids. If they need, give them anti-nausea medication to help them tolerate the oral fluids. If they can't tolerate oral fluids, think about an IV, but that really is not the ideal way to rehydrate. Our body is set up to take fluids orally. The gut absorbs them well. We distribute them well, so oral fluids are the best. People can get heat edema when you get hot. Your blood vessels dilate, and the blood vessels in the lower extremities tend to let the fluids leak out because they're dilated and there's a lot of pressure so people can get swelling in their hands and feet. And this is a self-limited disease. It's typically people get this uh, in the first few days or weeks when they're in a hot environment and then it goes away and they can elevate their extremities or put on compression stockings if it's really bothering them. The problem is, is congestive heart failure, kidney failure, and blood clots in the leg can present the same way. So you need to make sure they're not having any other symptoms that would make you think about those diseases. Heat cramps are very common. They're painful muscle spasms. We think that it's probably from low sodium and low potassium, mostly the low sodium, related to an inadequate salt intake. Again, in the American diet, inadequate salt intake is an almost impossible situation. But it can happen, and it tends to happen sort of acutely, so you're getting a lot of sweating, a lot of salt loss, and you get this event that happens. So these are people with typically a normal core body temperature. It might be up a little bit, but usually it's normal. They can get soreness or pain in their calves, their thighs, and their shoulders. They can also get abdominal muscle spasms. And typically this occurs at rest or after the exercise is finished, when blood flow increases to the muscles or when blood flow is changing to the muscles and the, you're getting rid of lactic acid and the salt balance is off and you get these spasms and they don't respond to massage because it's not an overuse, it's a salt problem. So treatment is oral rehydration and if they're getting these heat cramps then they don't have enough salt. So here you would think about salt replacement either with a, a one of the 
oral rehydration formulas that the World Health Organization puts out, which don't taste very good, or with a sports drink, preferably low sugar, because the sugar content in a regular sports drink is ridiculously high. And then they should increase their salt intake in their regular diet, which may lead to a little bit of heat edema as well initially, but that should resolve. In miliaria rubra, you have what's called heat rash or prickly heat. And your wet skin, when you're hot all the time, swells, and the sweat glands get obstructed and become inflamed. So typically, people get very itchy, and they have this red raised rash in covered areas. Because in uncovered areas, you don't get so much swelling, you don't get this plugging. But in the covered areas, or areas with poor circulation, you get this swelling, you get this plug, uh, plugged up sweat gland issue, and they can become infected and you can get a cellulitis. They may also affect your ability to effectively sweat. So if you've got a lot of this, you may no longer be able to cool yourself in a hot environment. So this is the typical rash that you see, so those red bumps in covered areas. Treatment Keep the skin clean. It's felt that the oils and dirts also contribute to plugging along with the edema. You can use diphenhydramine, Benadryl, 25 to 50 milligrams orally every six hours as needed for the itch. Allow the skin to completely dry for at least two hours of every day. That will help quite a bit. Keep cool and reduce your workload in the heat. And if there is an infection, a cellulitis, the patient will need antibiotics. And talk to medical control about the best choice for that. Heat exhaustion is severe water and salt loss associated with hyperthermia and increased core body temperature. The body maintains its ability to regulate the temperature if you can remove the heat stress. So if you stop the high workload, if you take the person out of the hot environment, they still have the ability to decrease their temperature. But it's if they keep in the hot environment, they keep that heat stress on, eventually they will overheat and lose their ability to control their temperature. Signs and symptoms can include fatigue and weakness. They may feel lightheaded or dizzy. When they stand up, they may feel like they're going to pass out. When you take their vital signs, they'll have a high heart rate, they'll be breathing quickly, their blood pressure may be on the low side, and their temperature will be above normal, above 100.3. They typically will have some heat cramps with this, so they'll have muscle cramping, their urine will be dark, they won't be urinating as much as normal, and they'll be sweating quite a bit because they're trying to offset this high heat stress. The treatment is to eliminate the heat stress. Um, and to do that, you need to take them out of the hot environment, somewhere cool, somewhere shady, out of the sun, and they can't return to work or to their heat until they return to their baseline. The temperature is normal, their vital signs are normal, and they no longer have symptoms. You need to cool them with a wet cover if they're very hot, so take a sheet, soak it in water, and then fan that. That is massive evaporative cooling. It's the most effective way to cool these people down. Uh, it's really even more effective than putting them into a cool, a cool water bath, an immersion bath. This is just highly effective. And fluid replacement, which can be several liters, preferably orally, an IV if you can't give them oral fluids, and if their blood volume is so low that you can't establish an IV, you can give them rectal fluids, which they will absorb. And consider evacuation if they're severely de dehydrated and, and have quite a bit of symptomatology. They're just feeling very poorly, and they're not getting better with your treatment. In heat stroke, you've got high heat stress, and then the body loses its ability to control the body temperature. So you get these uncontrolled rises in the body temperature, and above 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, they're at risk of death. It's a multi-system disease. The patient is FTD, fixing to die, and you need to cool them down as quickly as you can and as effectively as you can because otherwise they will die. Risks include high exertion, poor acclimatization, and if they have prickly heat and all those plug sweat glands, they're not going to be able to effectively sweat either. The presentation is a high temperature and altered mental status, and if you're not working in a hot environment and they're not at risk for uh, heat stroke, then this is a febrile illness like meningitis or sepsis. And if they are working in a hot environment and they're at risk for heat stroke, then this is heat stroke. So any altered mental status and a high core body temperature above 100.3, which is 38 degrees Celsius, that's heat stroke. 
The signs and symptoms will vary in classic heat stroke, which is what we tend to see in um, older individuals or unfit individuals. They'll have hot, dry skin, and they'll be fluid depleted. This comes on slowly over time. What you're going to tend to see in your population is what's called exertional heat stroke. So people who are fit or relatively fit, they're working in a hot environment, they're sweating, they're able to continue sweating, and they're not particularly dehydrated. Um, they just haven't been sweating so much that they've become dehydrated. They're just overwhelmed by heat and their body loses its ability to control the temperature. And so that's what you'll see. They may have ataxia, which means they're off balance, they're stumbling, they're falling around, they're weak, uh, their heart rate's fast, they're breathing quickly, their blood pressure's low. They may seem an anxious or confused or restless, but they have some change in their mental status. They may have seizures. And if it's classic heat stroke, the urine will be very dark. Um, or if they're going into kidney failure, because again, this is a multi-system disease, their urine may become dark or they may make no urine at all. This is a life-threatening emergency. You need to immediately cool them. So get them out of the heat stress, cover them with cool, wet sheets, and fan them. Now remember, they can't control their temperature going up. They also can't control it going down. So you need to monitor them for hypothermia because until their brain recovers and can start controlling their body temperature again, they're basically a lizard. They respond to the environmental temperature and you need to control that. You can immerse them in a cool bath if you have that available. Fluid replacement, remember that a lot of them aren't that fluid depleted, but treat the hypotension with fluids. Monitor their blood sugar. Their body is burning up a lot of sugar to try to control its temperature. So many of these people are hypoglycemic and will need sugar replacement and they'll need to be evacuated. Anyone with heat stroke who's lost their ability to control their temperature needs to be evacuated. If you have any questions, please contact your instructor or professor and don't forget to complete any knowledge assessments associated with this session. Thank you very much.